Shalom everyone. It is my honor and delight to introduce Dr. David B. Levy, who will speak about the topic of the Dead Sea Scrolls censorship on many different levels. Dr. Levy did much study on the Dead Sea Scrolls under Dr. Joseph M. Baumgarten, who was the halachic aspect expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls before the era of Dr. Lawrence Schiffman. By the way, Dr. Levy is related by his maternal lineage to Dr. Yosef David Allison, who is married to Dr. Lea Gluskin, and the brother-in-law of Dr. Arya Vilsker. While Vilsker found unknown poems of Rav Yehuda Halevi in the St. Petersburg Salty Cove Library Ferkovich collection, discoveries that rocked the Israeli academic and public worlds, his brother-in-law, Dr. Yosef David Amison, published hundreds of articles and books on the Dead Sea Scroll scholarships in over 12 languages. Dr. Levy's relationships to Dr. Vilsker and Amison, the Dead Sea Scroll scholar, are described in Dr. Levy's book, Gluskin Family History. Thank you so much, Alita, for that wonderful introduction. I want to welcome everybody. It's so wonderful to be with everybody again. Tonight, as Alita mentioned, we'll be discussing censorship on many different levels that involve the Dead Sea Scrolls. I was extremely blessed and lucky to be a student of Dr. Joseph Baumgarten from Vienna, who was the world's expert on the halakhic aspects of the Dead Sea Scrolls before the era of Dr. Lauren Schiffman. Um, also, a little personal connection, uh, the book uh, Gluskin Family History notes that through my mother, Zin, I'm related to Dr. Arya Vilsker through marriage, who was the brother-in-law of Dr. Joseph David Amison, who published hundreds of books and articles on the Dead Sea Scrolls and had a very different life, difficult life, ironically, as he was censored and his scholarship was censored under the communists in the former Soviet Union, as was Dr. Vilsker's research, which was primarily on discovering unpublished poems of Rabbi Huda Levy in the Salty Cup Library in St. Petersburg in the Ferkovich Collection. And since the communists didn't like Hebrew philology as a subject into itself, um, they only promoted folkish studies like Yiddish, so Vilsker had to publish only in Yiddish journals and smuggled out his um, worked as Ezra Fleischer, the Cairo Poetry Geniza Unit in Israel, who did verify that the poems he was discovering were not found in the Brody Collection or the collection of the Shadal, who anthologized Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's poems. Ah, so let's go on and talk about coincidences. Today is Motzi Shabbos, and I've just had a wonderful Malev Malko with my friends, and it is the day after Yud Tet Kislev, which is famous in Chabad history, and living history, for that matter, of the freeing of the Baal Hatanya. The Baal Hatanya, the first Lubavitch Rebbe, um, was imprisoned for not just sending money to Eretz Yisrael as a committed religious Zionist, but the victim of censorship by Mitnagdim, that is, rabbis who opposed the Hasidic movement. And due to Richilut, or tail-bearing, sort of uh, nasty backstabbing, he was reported to the authorities, uh, at that time the czars, and um, imprisoned, and uh, it wasn't a picnic, it was a lot of uh, suffering, Seret Nefesh in prison, and this, yesterday, this Shabbos was the release of the Baal Hatanya. A personal note in the Gluskin family history, my mother's, uh, Zachary Lamrecha's uh, great uncle, Rabbi Menachem Ben Gluskin, was imprisoned twice, along with his father, who was a Mitnagdid. Rabbi Eliezer Rabinovich. So you have this wonderful tikkun where Rabbi Eliezer Rabinovich took as a son-in-law a chassid, a chabad chassid. Rabbi Menachem Medel Gliskin, his father was Rabbi Aaron Gliskin of Parich after Rabbi Hill of Parich. And Rabbi Aaron's father was Rabbi Yeshua Gliskin of Lvov, who was a chabad luminary. And he, in turn, was, to make a long story short, was the grandson of Rabbi um, Moshe Zev Gliskin, who was a uh, chassid, and he was the son of Rabbi Eliezer uh, Gluskin, and it goes to the family Margolius, and back to the Maral. So these were a family of uh, largely Chumad Chassidim, and some Slonim, because Rabbi Dan of Slonim's daughter married, I think, uh, 
Rabbi Yeshua Gliskin's, uh, yeah, Rabbi Yeshua Glitzkin married the daughter of Rabbi Danislav, so you had Slonim and Chabad intermarrying there, and you have some Shklov as well. But with Rav Glitzkin, you see that there was great respect and devotion among Mitnagdim and Chassidim. So they overcame the mean, baseless hatred, Sinat Inam, responsible for the destruction of the Bayat Shani, uh, according to the Kamsa and the Bar Kamsa episode, uh, by a relationship of respect and um, honor and cherishing of uh, different aspects of Judaism that a Chabad Chassid, Dr. Lieberman, who was a brother-in-law of Rav Gluskin, said, Rav Gluskin as a Chassid, lone Chassid, at the table of Mitnagdim, which included Rav Shach and um, many other uh, great Rabbanim, the Chazonish, including that in Minsk, lived in Minsk, and um, Lieberman, his nephew, roomed with him. All at the Shabbos table you had this exotic plant, Lieberman says, of Rav Gluskin, so they overcame the, hopefully, the, the baseless hatred that was responsible for the Balatanya being in prison due to the tail-bearing arichilut of the Mitnagdim. And of course we know the uh, Shulchan Aruch HaRav and the Balatanya Chassidim all over the world are studying this work in every language of the human species. So, let's get on tonight. How do the Dead Sea Scrolls have to do with censorship? So many different levels. Okay. So let me, before I go into the Dead Sea Scrolls, I want to know we had a wonderful Malev Malcha here tonight, and um, we ate sushi. Um, and the sushi is very important for the Gilgalim of the Tzadikim. Uh, the Tzadikim uh, in uh, um, the Blessing uh, Achrona are mentioned, uh, and so I'm going to do a bracha. I'm not just going, as in former lectures, to say a bracha over water, uh, the um, uh, but I'm going to finish, eat the sushi and uh, tag it with this blessing about eating fish which is thought to be a very theurgic mystical aspect. Let's think of the fish. They weren't subsumed to Puruvuvu. The fish, um, I mean they were, they were commanded Puruvuvu and they were not subjected to Ayin Ra. And the uh, Gedolim, the Tanaim are called the great fish in the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's a Hasidic parable since it's the Yud, one day after Yud Tet Kislev when the fish come up to the top of the water where they see the sunlight they, and it rains, it looks like they're trying to dr drink every extra drop of rainwater, yet they're surrounded by Torah, by water, and they look like they have to get that extra drop because it's a never enough, even though they're surrounded by water. Isn't that something? What a wart, a Hasidic wart. And the fish, we know so much about him, about the famous story about Yosef, who was very poor and he saved up all Shabbos to enjoy fish, and um, he spent every last time on having fish for Shabbos, and luckily Hashem would have it in Hashkacha Pratit that the fish that he bought for that Shabbos and was, you know, spent all his resources had a precious gem in it, so he recuperated his losses and was able to honor the Shabbos many more over by having fish. So we just had a wonderful Malem Malka with sushi. I'm going to say the bracha and then eat the sushi, and then follow up with the bracha akrona that refers as a remez to the Gilgalim of the Tzadikim by eating fish in particular. So, we of course begin it with what we'd say over water is Shachol. Baruch Adonai Eleinu Melech Alam Shachol Amen. Mmm. Remember, in, um, or Shemesh, a Hasidic work, brings down a Gemara that in Gan Eden they're eating salted and fresh Leviathan. And Eliyahu Monk, in his recent collection of uh, essays that were recently released in one volume, which I reviewed, um, has a wonderful essay that Leviathan doesn't literally mean fish necessarily, but has many, many sublime meanings. Look into the essay if you want to know the secrets of eating fish on a Maleb Malka. Now I'm going to say the Bracha Akrona, which refers as a remez to the Gilgalim of the Tzadikim. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alam Borei Nafshot Rabot Vechech Saranan Al Kol Ma Shebarata Lehachayot Behem Nefesh Kol Chai Baruch Hayei HaOlamim Lehechayot is a remez to this idea of 
helping the um, Gilgalim of the Tzadikim through eating fish in a Malev Malka. Now, let's get to the Dead Sea Scrolls and my salad days when I was in graduate school working a full-time job in a public library. It was really grueling. Um, and then pursuing this doctorate degree as well. Um, I was heavily into Dead Sea Scrolls. And um, in many aspects, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls exemplify censorship because, one, you have censorship that um, after they were discovered, the monopoly or the cartel of the Harvard Jesuit Catholic scholars, um, often to the gripes of some scholars who felt excluded, um, prevented other scholars from having access to the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was broken open by a revolutionary discovery of two different movements. One was the Bechtel Navigatives, which were photographs which were illegally um, photographed, perhaps later deposited in the Huntington Library, remained dormant for a while, and then when it was legal to release them, uh, the Moffat, uh, uh, the uh, head librarian, made them available and the cartel was broken, while at the same time you had the force of some scholars um, influenced by, I think, um, Wachholder and Herschel Shanks, who, due to complete cunning and sophisticated uh, logical um, virtuosity, had been able to simulate through computer uh, science um, what many of the fragments reconstructed would look like based on what had previously been released. So the cunning of history, they outsmarted the Harvard, Harvard Kotel of Jesuits by using computer science technology to simulate what many of the fragments probably uh, would look like even though they hadn't been released. So that's an aspect of censorship. We'll go back to that in just a moment. Then, to mention um, my relatives through my mother's Yechuzin, uh, Rav uh, Vilsker, Dr. Vilsker, I should say, the son-in-law of Rav Menachem Menegluskin, he was censored greatly because the communists didn't like Jewish studies at all, what we call modern terms after the 1960s Jewish studies, or in that age, Hebrew philology and Hebrew history, medieval history. He had discovered unknown poems of Rav Yehuda Levi, and he was censored greatly. He could only publish them in um, a Yiddish publication, and he had to put them through the mail in Yiddish to get under the censors of the communists and sent to the Kohen Gadol of uh, medieval Hebrew uh, poetry, Cairo Geniza unit. That was first, the money was raised by Schocken, who was a great philanthropist in Germany. And then after the Nazis came to power, it relocated to Israel. Anyway, uh, Ezra Fletcher was in Israel, and he did many great things. He wrote on the Kedusha, in the Amidah, the Shemona Esrei, and he was pioneered the work of uh, Ibn Labrat, who was very famous for Dor Yikra. You know, on Shabbos, I love the Sephardic melody. It's terrific. This song will send you through the seven heavens. Speaking of the seven heavens, Dead Sea Scrolls wrote some very esoteric works themselves. The Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, which I believe were uncovered or brought to light by Carol Myers and her team. Uh, these are songs um, that um, describe the Maase Merkabah a subject that's very esoteric and secretive. And if you want to know what censorship is all about, in essence, in Death and Decency Selba, it's about power, it's about elitism, it's about exclusiveness, it's about authority, which is very important in Judaism. We always look for an authoritative reception history. And it's about secretiveness. That's why I mentioned secrets of the songs of the Sabbath sacrifice. And it's about exclusivism. So, uh, Amnison had a very hard life and his... Uh, Eshet Chayel Leah Gluskin, who was a doctor herself, who was an expert in Second Temple Judaism, published and studied Philo, Josephus, Dead Sea Scrolls, and the formation of the Mishnah and history of the Second Temple period. She wrote a wonderful um, kind of memorial to her husband, and she describes um, how hard a life her husband, Dr. Joseph Amison, had. He was censored very heavily. He couldn't find a steady shtel, and it was much harder to publish, and he really uh, had over anti-Semitism weighed against him. You want to know a little secret of our family? In the picture of in Ezra Fleischer, when he brought to light R.A. Vilsker's findings of the, some of the um, poems of Rabbi Yehuda Levi in the Salt Lake Library that were unknown in a academic work called Kiryat uh, Sefer, the sweater that Vilsker is wearing 
it actually belonged to David Joseph Joseph David Amundsen. Amundsen had predeceased Vilsker, and that picture of Vilsker, which is the only picture in Kiryat Sefer where they ever had a picture of a scholar, it was all text-based. Um, that exceptional issue with the picture of the scholar of Leningrad, St. Petersburg, Petrograd, we would say, um, was the sweater of his brother, uh, Joseph Amundsen. So, let's go on and note some of what are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Many people don't know, but the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves, I would argue, are an aspect of censorship. Why is that? That's because the Dead Sea Scrolls, who my teacher, Joseph Baumgarten, feels were the Essenes. They censored the Sadukim, the Sadducees, who were Hellenized uh, by Greek culture. They were usually more wealthy than the Perushim, the Pharisees, the rabbis, and certainly the Essenes, because the Essenes lived as communists of la Letra, sharing all their property in common. And the Essenes would censor not only the Sadukim, but they'd censor the Perushim, the rabbis, for not being Machmir enough. So, for instance, in rabbinic law, we wait till three stars can be seen for the signal that Shabbos is over. Um, the Hasidim like to extend Shabbos, but they would wait five stars. Or the Essenes would separate dough for the Kohanim, and mostly the Essenes were Kohanim, disgruntled Kohanim, who were dissatisfied with, the, particularly during the period of Alexander Janias, who was a Saduki, and his wife was Shlom Tzion, who was the sister of Sh uh, the Rav Batin, Shimon ben Shetach, and then when Alexander passed on, she reinstituted the Purushim, but many disgruntled Kohanim were amongst the Essenes. I mention it because, um, you know, the Essenes uh, were very machmir. They had a tachum, you know, in, in rabbinic law, we can't go out more than 2,000 cubits. They made it 1,000 cubits. Um, and they also separated hala in each kneading of each particular halot but the rabbis separate in each batch. And the Sudukim, I think they separate in a larger amount. So um, Rabbi Baumgarten's method was really a form of kiruv as well, because he would teach rabbinic normatization of halacha and its history throughout the millennium through comparing the halachot of the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they differed a little bit, often being more machmir than even the Purushim, the rabbis. Isn't that amazing? The, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were very machmir. They didn't eat the oils, they didn't anoint themselves in oil. Um, and we'll see some of the differences that make all the differences in Tevel Yom, in um, the, the washing of the menorah, all sorts of things. So, let's get back before we go to uh, the actual halachot of the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they compare with mainstream rabbinic halacha to... Um, since this is one day after Yud Ted Kislev, you know, books like Hagaon, the biography of the Vilna Gaon, the Gra by Dov Eliach, was banned by many Hasidic leaders for its attacks on Hasidus. And there are many works that have been banned and censored. I think Slifkin, who gives views of evolution in his work, has been censored. Um, we have books like Making of a Gadol by Rabbi uh, Natan Kamenetsky, was banned by Rabbi uh, Yosef Shalom El Yeshiv, and and you find these these things going on, uh, the dignity of difference by Jonathan Sachs, which was misunderstood as you know teaching all religions teach the same things. Well, the differences make all the differences. Drew White's Rosemond shows, um, and you know we can't say they're all just teaching love and happiness and brotherhood and sisterhood. Differences are very important. There are the details in the footnotes that we need to be aware of. Um, not to divide people and to call it sinat hinam, but to respect differences um, and to um, celebrate differences. Um, anyway, with that said, there are many um, works that have been censored. In a more humorous note, the Kosher Yeshka by Rabbi Shmuley Boteach was banned in 2012 by the Chabad Rabbi, um, Rabbi Yaakov Emanuel Shochet, um, and possibly for some legitimate reasons. I mean, you can't be uh, a Christian and be a Jew, even though the early Christians looked at themselves as a break-off Jewish sect. And I could say many more things about sort of the politics of uh, censorship. Um, there was uh, my uncle the Nitziv, which was uh, censored and so forth and so forth. By the way, that's a high circulating book in our collection. Anyway, so censored books often are really hot to, to, to look at. Um, 
let's go back to the censorship of, quote, the elite coterie cartel of the Jesuit monopoly of Harvard on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So um, many people felt it wasn't fair that this tightly controlled research monopoly maintained by a coterie of Jesuit editors since the discovery of the scrolls was um, taking place and excluding some scholars who wanted access to be able to do research on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they felt when the Bechtel negatives hit, along with the com clever computer simulation by Wachholder and Herschel Shanks, um, that that was like the equivalent of breaking down the Berlin Wall. Um, yeah. And uh, it really was revolutionary in questions of uh, intellectual property and access. And um, there are many experts in that field. I am not one of them. I did publish a paper on, uh, you know, plagiarism and citing your footnotes. And why is it the Rambam in this Mishnah Torah behind me that is owned by, used to be owned by Ben Zion Wachholder and Dr. Lieberman is another one. Why did the Rambam not cite his footnotes that the Ketsa Mishnah puts up that, you know, this, view is in the name of this Tana or Amara? Big question. Um, so, uh, these Harvard Coterie of Scholars had a monopoly on the manuscripts, and um, they felt that when Bechtel's uh, negatives were deposited sort of secretively in the Huntington Library and some other libraries, that that constituted stolen property. So, um, there were arguments made along those lines that it wasn't right, that um, when the head librarian of the Huntington released them, but he was within his legal right because they had uh, come into some notion of fair use by then. The right to make the material available to scholars is a uh, view of whether you believe in um, a freedom of access uh, to a certain extent, and many elitists don't. Um, only authors retain property rights to unpublished material, and so the scrolls were in the, in the public domain. Moffitt, the head librarian of Huntington, said. Um, the custodians of the scrolls insist that virtually all of the intact biblical material has always been open to reputable scholars. But the critics of the, quote, coterie would say, you had to have letters of recommendations from elite universities to get access to their seeing the scrolls and um, so forth and so forth. It was a lot of elitism. There are people like Bialik in ha the poem Hamat Mead, one of my favorite Hebrew poems, and he describes, you know, the elitism in the rabbinic community. This rabbi was being trained as a pulpit rabbi. This rabbi is going into kashrut. This rabbi into fundraising. And all his colleagues in the yeshiva were being groomed for this great match and this great shidduch. And this little guy in the, in the corner that Bialik identifies with was learning lishma and learning lishma and learning lishma. And nobody ever took a note of him, although he was probably the most virtuous in his intentions in learning. I love Bialik's poems, and because Bialik was not a religious Jew, you find censorship amongst the religious on Bialik, who was a great poet. In fact, I wrote a wonderful, and I, I'm not going to trump myself up, it was just an average paper, but because I know French and German, I was able to bring in comparing Lamartine's Le Lac and Goethe's uh, Storm and Drung movement and the Lake poets of uh, England, Blake and Shelley and Byron and Keats, and of course Rilke from the German tradition and compare it with Bialik's poems as a form of romanticism. So I looked at El Hatzipur, which is a poem about a bird that flies across the geography of Eretz Yisrael, and it's a Zionistic poem. And the Bialik got into trouble for writing it while he was learning in yeshiva, because it was that time it wasn't de rigueur or popular to be a Zionist, a religious Zionist, at a time um, at, th at those times. Um, although there was a long or large movement of religious Zionism, I have a PowerPoint on it on the Torah website, which Dr. Strickman teaches and taught at the Lander College for Women. Now, Yalak wrote other poems. Uh, Habrecha, which is, he, his father was a lump in the lumber business, and he would go through the forest and he would see a pond, a brecha, a pool, and he would describe it during the summer, the spring, the autumn, and the fall, sort of like an impressionist paper, you know, looking at the, um, the, the different mountains in the south of France at different times of years. It's a great poem, and it looks at what a brecha, a pool, is, not just the tevel halachically, but the refreshing aspect of the pool and all its different times of the year when it's frozen over and when it comes to life in the spring. And he wrote other poems that are so important, including Al Ha'ir Hashiga in the City of Slaughter, which was commissioned, and Bialik took a position that 
um, the Jews of uh, the pogrom uh, should have fought back. Why were they mice hiding in the attics? You know, why didn't they get militarized and fight back against the pogrom thugs? Well, my grandmother, Zacharon Laracha, was in a pogrom in Gomel, which occurred at the same time as Kishnev, basically. And she said, if you tried to fight back, you'd be murdered. Uh, so that's her answer to Bialik's Musul Judaism, um, you know, to like heavy weapons in Demona of the nuclear sort. That might be necessary too. And my grandmother always cited uh, Joseph uh, uh, Agnon's poem, short story rather, um, Mase Haez, the story of a goat. And the story of a goat is about a very poor family like most of our ancestors in Eastern Europe. And the family relied on the goat for not only cheese, butter, and milk, but for actually making clothes and so forth. And then some pogrom thugs come along during a, a wave of pogrom name, and the father uh, has to shek the goat and dips a talus in the blood of the goat and hangs it up on the porch so that the um, thugs think the violence already hit that house. And where was that talus from? That was from the bar mitzvah boy's tali talus that his mother knit from the goat's hair and the goat had to be shected. And the brilliance of Agnon, if you know his work, is he brings different layers of Mishnaic and Talmudic and medieval and modern Hebrew and even biblical Hebrew. The, the goat is likened to the Ketunat Pasim of Yosef. And so they used this goat as a decoy which they hung on the porch to show the violence that already happened there with the bloody talus to show the thugs, oh, the violence already hit this house, so don't, don't attack us. And they managed to survive. So that was Agnon's Midrash to Bialik's po uh, poem, Ala Irash Kinga, that, you know, it, you have to be smart about the way you fight back. Um, and, the and the military victory of the Maccabees, which is coming up um, in the Al Hanisim uh, prayer, the rabbis are not so much remembering the military might, although that was significant. It was that the impure were delivered into the hands of the pure. The many, they had weapons, they had, they had elephants for God's sakes, the Syrian Greeks. And the, this little ragtag band of guerrilla fighters, the Maccabees, were able to defeat this larger force through purity, through sanctification, through rededication of the Beit HaMikdash, through Kedusha. And that is how we beat them through our tefillot, through our learning. And, um, you know, um, that, that's a great statement of the al Hanisim prayer, which I've actually done a Devar Torah on elsewhere, if you want to hear more about that. That the Kol Yaakov that rings in the, in the yeshivot of Shem Aver, that's the military victory of the Maccabees. Anyway, uh, let's go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So these uh, Harvard scholars who were elite uh, were blocking access to scrolls of certain scholars, largely Jewish scholars in some sense. Uh, Dr. Schiffman, for instance, notes that um, a professor of Hebrew and Judaic studies at New York University said, quote, they may be releasing stolen property, that is the Bechtel negatives, but I'm going to use it anyway. Most will regard those who make this material available as Robin Hoods, stealing from the academically privileged to give to those hungry for the knowledge secreted in those texts. A little joke, you know, when, when the release and the breaking of the uh, elite cartel that was censoring access to the Dead Sea Scrolls sort of hit like wildflower in the popular press, you know, like Namport Key, these, these, these news announcers, you know, who didn't know anything about Dead Sea Scrolls, they, they referred to the Dead Sea Scrolls, squirrels, squirrels, you know, they, Freudian, they didn't know that it was scrolls and they said squirrels. So a lot of this is very humorous, you know, um, if you have a sense of uh, the comic dimension of reality. But the scrolls, what are they? They consist of about 800 manuscripts in Hebrew and Aramaic, some in Greek, that were discovered in caves east of Jerusalem near the ruins of Qumran on the Dead Sea. The discoveries from 1947 and 56 were one of the archaeological sensations of the century. I'd say also, you know, uh, the Nag Hammerstadi uh, uh, discoveries and also um, the Cairo Geniza were big ones and many other ones we could say as well. Um, but the Dead Sea Scrolls were definitely certainly one of the most important in the Encyclopedia Judaica um, is filled with that, trumping the Jewish Encyclopedia in certain regards, such as Gershom Sholem pioneering the academic study of Jewish mysticism and the Dead Sea Scroll findings to some extent. So um, we'll say more about what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. They're much more than that. They're important to Christians too, and this is one of the reasons Christians 
are so um, great in Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship because they do show um, the origins of Christianity. Uh, this Essene sect of Jews, they were clearly Jews. They were very, they were more Jewish than the rabbis, put it that way. They were more machmir in their halakot. And um, they were very ascetic, however, like many monastic Christians. So that when Father DeVoe, uh, a Jesuit who was excavating Qumran, describes an inkwell he found there that was a writing table with, and they analyzed the carbon dating, they found it had ink, he said it was a scriptorium. Well, that's a Latin word for a monastery that, you know, is copying sacred texts. But even though the anachronism, the analogy could fit, these, these people, even though they were Jewish and very ascetic Jews, um, they do show some relationship to ascetic trends in early Christianity. I could say more about that later. Nearly all the original scrolls were originally housed in the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem, with a few others on display in the Shrine of the Book in Yerushalayim and elsewhere, um, including uh, Harvard, Hebrew Union College, Cincinnati, Oxford University, JTS, etc. There at Claremont is where the story of the Huntington's acquisition begins. In 1980, Elizabeth Hay Bechtel, a philanthropist who founded the fin financed the Claremont Center, arranged to have the scroll material in Jerusalem photographed by Robert Schlosser, Baruch Hashem, the Huntington's chief photographer who was hired for the job on a freelance basis. One set of the negatives went to the Claremont Center for research uh, use, and a master set was stored elsewhere. So Miss Bechtel got into some political controversy with Dr. Jane Sanders, the Claremont Center's executive vice president, uh, when she withdrew her support of the institution and took the master set of photographs to the Huntington Library, which she donated. She did not sell. Um, and uh, they're priceless. And she built a 90,000 special air-conditioned vault to hold these things. You know, this is a major philanthropist, like, like the Pritzker philanthropist, maybe even more so. According to the head librarian, Dr. Uh, Moffett, after Miss Bechtel's death in 1987, the photographs became the property of the library and she left no restrictions on their use. But the existence of the photographs was known to only a few. Um, Saunders is reported as saying, Dr. Saunders, we're very disappointed with the Huntington Library. You see, they're breaking the censorship of denying access to a greater group of people to Dead Sea Scrolls. The editorial cartel of the Harvard um, coterie of Jesuits was losing its control over access to the documents. More leading scholars were speaking out against the policies of the secretiveness and the exclusivity of censorship. The Oxford Center for Postgraduate and Hebrew Studies in England announced it was opening an extensive collection of scroll photographs through computer reconstructions that was largely made possible by Walkholder and Dr. Herschel Shanks. Two researchers of Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati announced the publication of the first volume of a computer-generated reconstruction of previously unpublished scroll texts without any access to the documents themselves. They devised a huge computer program. It was ingenious. That used a listing of all the words in one collection of scrolls to reconstruct part of the original text. Dr. Shanks, president of the Biblical Archaeological Society, which published the reconstructed text, said, the Huntington's action would not alter his plans to bring out other volumes of computer-generated checks. But Mr. Shanks, Dr. Shanks, who had led a vigorous campaign for open access to the scrolls, welcomed the decision saying, I think the cartel is simply falling about. Censorship is not to be had. Now, Dr. Cross, who uh, is still in charge of the Dead Sea Scrolls, he was against this. He says, this involves theft of scholarly work, and if published, would be condemned. Um, the letters should be included, include the applicant's scholarly credentials and objective as, if possible, letters of recommendation. So getting access to the text before the Bechtel negatives uh, went wild in the open and uh, the computer-generated um, text of uh, Wachholder and Shanks uh, was very difficult. You had to be really an elite Princeton, Harvard, Yale, sort of creme de la creme, madrin la madrin, up to snuff, the Grey Poupon kind of stamp to get access to them. Dr. Shipman said in an article in the New York Times uh, titled, uh, Monopoly Over Dead Sea Scrolls Ended, my students will now be able to work with full set of manuscripts and write their disputations without having to fear that they can be disproven by some unpublished text in the hands of a student of one of the 
elite editors. So this censorship of the Harvard coterie of Jesuit scholars were denying access to other scholars um, to the scrolls was a form of censorship. It might have been legally uh, legitimate, but it was a form of censorship. Uh, and I'm not saying what my position is. Uh, there are arguments for and against what happened in increasing access to the scrolls and uh, also for uh, questions of intellectual freedom that were largely done to increase access. But we must concern, as a librarian, you know, we take courses on donor agreements and access restrictions and copyright for sure, which I published on, I think, in the Montreal uh, AJL um, you know, uh, proceedings in which the rabbis also have notions of copyright. They use four models. Uh, Nehemiah Goldberger, the chief rabbi of the Beit Din in Yerushalayim, had written wonderful articles on this. Um, one is uh, Hash, Hashgat Gavul, you know, in Vayikra it says, if I own a piece of land, I can't take my boundary and move it and steal somebody else's land. You know, Hashgat Gavul, moving the boundary. And he analogizes that, many other rabbis earlier did do, uh, to stealing uh, somebody's ideas. I can say Paris is the capital of France, that's common knowledge. Or that, you know, a leader is so many courts, that's just objective knowledge. Uh, but once I start passing off people the way they've strung pearls on the strings, ideas and findings as my own, I have to give credit where credit is due according to the Hashgat Kabul model, or according to three other models of Dine Malkuta Dina, and uh, also there's a, the metaphor of the fisherman's net, and uh, there, there are two other models that are used. Look at my paper at AJL in Montreal if you're interested in uh, that question. But intellectual freedom? Wow. You know, the Archie Bunkers of the world who are academics should say, I believe you can hole up in the great library like the New York Public Duro Division, and if you're motivated and you have a good reading list and you have some smarts, you can learn just as much as people at the most elite universities. Um, you might not make as much money for it, and you might not get such a wonderful lectureship circuit, but you'll know as much because it's not what you know, but who you know and how you play the game. Unfortunately, when we're talking about elitism and um, you know the politics, which uh, is basically... Um, what goes on in much of uh, the world uh, in any discipline. So, I just want to say something about the Harvard um, uh, coterie being broken by, um, you know, the Bechtel negatives and the simulated computer indexes. Um, I won't say much more about that, but there's an important article in College and Research Libraries News, Volume 52, Number 10, which, if you're interested in library science issues of uh, copyright and uh, freedom of information, freedom of access, and stuff like that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good article. And um, persons wishing to study at Huntington must file a written application to be admitted as a reader. You know, it mentions how uh, access is allowed. Um, we're living in an age which is remarkable, digitization. I published a little short blog on this, which I wrote a whole monograph on. Things are becoming democratized in many ways. Um, you know, you, the Cairo Geniza, for instance, uh, much of it's being digitized, not all of it. And that means that a scholar in China or across the world who can't physically travel to England to access the Cairo uh, Geniza, it's also gone to JTS and many other great libraries as well, um, fragments from the Cairo Geniza that Schechter pulled out. He had been preceded by Ferkowitz, for the matter, but... Um, it, you know, the question of now a lot of it's digitized online. If you go to the University of Pennsylvania, um, Cairo Geniza link, and you can search some wonderful things, get or, uh, Rambam's Mishnah Torah, like his own Hat Khatima signature on an early edition that he edited and stuff like that. You can get angiology texts that are in the Cairo Geniza, really great stuff. Even recipes for beverages, alcoholic drinks of innkeepers. All sorts of great stuff there, digitized, largely by Stefan Reif um, and his crew. And um, so things are being democratized. The spring waters are being spread. I remember I gave a paper in Arizona. And in the airport, I just happened to meet a Chabadnik. You know, they're so friendly and they're so welcoming generally. He said, are you, what are you doing? You, I was dressed, you know, in, in my tzitzit. And he saw that I had, a, you know, it looked like a Jewish. So he says, uh, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to this conference to give a paper in, uh, where was it, in, uh, somewhere in Arizona. 
Um, and he says, which one? I said, oh, yeah, I'm going there too. I'm giving a paper. I was like, on what? He says, on uh, HebrewBooks.org. I said, wow, that sounds really interesting. He said, yeah, because we believe with the best that the Mashiach cannot arrive until the wellsprings of Torah are disseminated to the four corners of the world. And with digitization, which is occurring with published books and lesser, some even some non-published things like the letters of Emily Dickinson, uh, you're getting greater access. You're getting the wellsprings of Torah disseminated to the four corners of the world. And so he referred to himself in kind of an archived Deridian manner, uh, archive fever, of going to all these libraries in Europe and across the world and other well, lesser well-known collections and just photographing them and arch uh, digitizing them to put them up on HebrewBooks.org so that, as the best says, the Mashiach can come when the wellsprings of Torah are disseminated uh, to the four corners of the world. I remember meeting one scholar, he's Chinese, uh, he's not Jewish, although he's a Philo-Semite, and he wrote a work on the Jews in China, which is really a tour de force. And how did he do it? He did it through the computer, with an internet connection to digitize collections. And, you know, he learned original sources in the original languages, and uh, that's what's opening up here. Independent scholars are sometimes trumping, not all the time, the, you know, coterie of elite people who had the privilege of going to the elite schools where they drive around in golf carts. Um, and, you know, uh, yes, they're very bright people there and they have a lot of money for science, which is necessary to have big microscopes and lab research. But in humanities, it's often very political, not what you know, but who you know and how you play the game. So let's get to um, Dr. Baumgarten and what he taught me. Um, here I was at a small college university in Baltimore, Maryland, having a relationship with one of the greatest scholars of the Lachic aspects of the Dead Sea Scrolls, Dr. Joseph Baumgarten, who was from Vienna. I'll tell you one anecdote he told me. Um, he was like from around Vienna or in Austria, and when the Anschluss came in, he said, the rights that were given in the French Enlightenment, that Jews could be government officials, or Jews didn't have to pay Jew, extra Jew taxes, or Jews had greater freedom of mobility, and certain rights of man that were given, etc., he said they were taken away in a flash of the day because his town, where Jews had lived for over a thousand years, was like liquidated in a week. So go figure. You think you have rights? They're very fragile. Okay. So, we're now going to begin with um, uh, where are the Dead Sea Scrolls mentioned in ancient texts. But before that, I want Noelita is going to give you uh, the link to a paper that I gave at the Cleveland AJL Proceedings and it was organized very carefully. Um, the first section is on ancient mention of the Essenes. Then the second section was the Essenes' view of immortality, angiology, hashkacha pratit, uh, dualism, and the calendar. They held the solar calendar, my first lecture, um, which I didn't have time to expound on uh, the wonderful calendar of Jubilees that the Dead Sea Scrolls followed and how that through all, you know, was totally different than what the Pharisees, the rabbis were doing in, in throughout Israel. So that Rabbi Gamiel came to the Dead Sea Scroll sect uh, on the day that the reckoning uh, fell, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls for Yom Kippur, to say, nah, 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 this isn't the right day for Yom Kippur because you're doing a solar calendar and we Jews, we follow a solar lunar calendar. Um, and then, of course, that's echoed in Masechah Rosh Hashanah, Lahabdi, on a different sense, when Rabbi Yeshua submits to Rabban Gamliel and says to the effect, you know, I'm taking my calculations, which say Yom Kippur is today, but I'm traveling to meet you because I recognize you're the Nasi, the Ab Bet Din, and I recognize your authority above mine. So, um, we looked at the calendar. I won't say much more about that. You want to see about the secrets of the Dead Sea Swell calendar? A lot of secrets. Look at my AJL presentation. The set, part three was on halacha. That is, Rabbi Baumgarten's method is to compare the halacha of the rabbis, the Purushim, uh, with that of the Essenes and with that of the Sadducees, for that matter. Um, and so we looked at the para adama and Tabo Yom. We looked at aspects of purities, animal bones, the nisuk, a stream from a, from a body of water, the immersion of the menorah, the Nege'im, the oils, to talk about the immersion of the menorah. For instance, the Pharisees, the rabbis say, you have to immerse the menorah to be purified after every one of the three major pilgrimage holidays because the hoi polloi come more in contact in proximity with the menorah. The Sadducees said, no, 
The menorah is supernatural because the seven branches refer to the seven planets. You know, in Chabad they have straight menorot, and um, in the Bodolin Library, Rambam doodles with the straight ones, but on the Arch of Titus you have, as Rob Herzog noted, uh, that the base was probably broken, and it had some pagan deities on it, um, that the on the Arch of Titus you have the rounded ones, the semicircle. But whatever it was, the Sadducees said it didn't need to be immersed. Guess what? The Essenes say it needs to be immersed too, I think. Uh, I also dealt in my second impurities on uh, oils. The Essenes avoided oils. The Greeks, remember, were big in anointing and oil. That's how they cleaned themselves. They put oil on their bodies. And with scrapers, they took off scented oils. And also eating oils. Like if I have a vat of olives, and it's got some oil in there with the olives, and I pour it into another vat, and that first vat of olives is impure, tame. The nisik, the stream from the vat of the impure, will make impure the vat that might be pure of whatever's being poured into. It reminds me in Baltimore where I live, there's this uh, uh, country club, I never belonged to it, a lot of German Jews did, called the Suburban Club. And it's immediately adjacent to a cemetery. And the cemetery has a pond, and the pond goes under the roadway, and bubbles up into the golf course where there's a pond. You know, golf courses, they have a lot of ponds. And if you hit the, the golf ball there, you're in trouble. But um, for the Pharisees, that cemetery pond that fed into the golf court pond is making Tame, the whole suburban court uh, course, uh, golf course, you know, whatever. So that's uh, Pharisaical law versus the Sudukim. The Sudukim would say, no, that Nisik of the cemetery pond is not making impure the pond of the golf course, etc. And indeed, they were more wealthy Jews at the Suburban Club. I think at another country club you had the Russian, the Russian uh, Jews went to that one. I forgot, Woodhome or something, whatever. So I'm just joking, I'm joking. And so I also dealt with the Omer offering. Um, that's a very complex salacha. I dealt with no trade or mercantilism amongst themselves sharing property. Uh, they were communists of Olna Letra, the Dead Sea Scrolls were. If you joined the community, according to the Sarah de Yachad, you gave over all your property to the Essene community. Um, then I dealt with archaeological surveys and excavations, uh, penalties for infractions. They were very strict. You know, if you fell asleep while trying to learn, that's a serious thing. You know, it showed disrespect. I mentioned Philo's mentioned in the Essenes, Dead Sea scholars like Schechter, Sukenik, and DeVoe. Have to mention Schechter, I can't not. Schechter gave to Lewis Ginsburg a work that was the Damascus document. That's a big conundrum. How in a medieval, largely medieval Geniza, like the Cairo Geniza, did the Damascus document, which is from Second Temple, show up? Well, he found it there and he gave it to Lewis Ginsburg. And Ginsburg published in German a work called Ein Bekannte Jüdische Sekt, an unknown Jewish sect. But now we know who they were, according to Dr. Baumgarten. They were the Essenes. Although there are some streams of Dead Sea Scroll scholars that are challenging that the uh, Dead Sea Scroll authors were not Essenes, that they were disgruntled Sadukim. I think Dr. Schiffman has voiced that view in the past. So I also had other things, maps and carbon-14 dating and halakhic uh, uh, aspects of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Hasmonean family, uh, biblical manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Isaiah Scroll, for instance, I think differs in uh, six or seven or eight little differences from what we have in the Masoretic tradition. That's pretty amazing. So look at that paper, and I hope uh, Alita will include the link. Let's go to where is the where the Essenes mentioned in ancient literature. So in the Loeb Classical Library, in Pliny's Natural History, Part Five, Section Seventy Three, we find. Ita per saculorum milia incredibile dictum, gens eterna est in qua nemo nascitur, tam ficunda ilis allurium vita paententia est. So uh, my crude Latin would translate that in this way, this people, the Essenes, has lasted, strange to say, for many generations, though no one is born within it, although Josephus says 10%, 15% did marry and have children, so fruitful to them is the penitence of life. Isn't that wonderful? Penitentia est. Penitence for life which others feel. This group was in perpetual Teshuvah mode. This group was, 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 they had a view of Revelation, and they were producing really creative texts as well as copying texts, that their Mora Hatzedek was like, like a, a kind of Moshe Rabbeinu who was able to reveal 
and had Nevoah, prophecy. Anyway, I'm, get, I'm getting a little off sidetrack. Let's go back to another ancient Greek, uh, ancient Latin uh, mention. Um, Pliny references that Ein Gedi is lying below, Infrahos, an Essene settlement. Salinas describes the destruction of Ein Gedi and Gada Apidum Infra Essenos Fuit said Exisum Est. And Dio in Salinas Collection of Rerum Memorabilium 3512 remarks that Essenes had a very happy city, Polis Holon Eudaimonia. Eudaimonia means happiness. Agrippa refers to Essenes as eternal, gens eterna. Now, I want to note that the Essene hypothesis linked to Qumran is based on a number of notions which include more than I'm going to list. One, their avoidance of oil. In the Jewish wars, Josephus brings that down, uh, is known to stem from the role of liquids as transmitters of impurity in rabbinic law. The Essenes teveled in a loincloth. If a Jew goes to a mikvah, they don't cover themselves. You know, they even pare down their nails and, you know, the water's got to even go into the mouth a little bit. Uh, the Essenes were very modest, almost a Christian notice, notion of modesty. They had a loincloth that they teveled in, in Josephus Wars 2.16. There was a ban on spitting in public. I remember uh, one um, Shoah survivor told me, anytime he sees a Mercedes, they'll spuchen auf die Dach. I'll spit on the floor. Das ist ein deutsches Auto mit schmutziger Geld gekaufen. Wir kauft nicht bei die Germanen. He was so traumatized by what he went through by the Nazis that just seeing a Mercedes made him think that it was dirty money. You know, Menachem Begin would not allow Mercedes Benz to drive in Israel because he would not take Wiedergutgemachengeld from the Germans. And yet some later uh, Israelis said, no problem, we'll take the Mercedes Benz and we'll drive them all over Israel. So different opinions about that. So they had a ban on spitting. The Essene Shabbat strictness exemplified by requirement that all food be prepared beforehand and by a prohibition against moving any utensil. <coughs> so that's a little different than rabbinic law. Married Essenes avoided sex during pregnancy. In the second you have a mo <coughs> it mentions that it's actually good for the fetus if uh, a woman is pregnant and her husband has relations with her up to a certain point before the child is born. The Essenes insisted on fulfilling their binding oaths even in the face of death. So they were very big on oaths. You know, in Judaism, I wrote a whole monograph on this, that the way a doctor tells over a diagnosis can be very ser uh, serious. So if you want to give the uh, patient hope, you mentioned this study that was kind of rare out of the blue. Uh, you know, this it defied the statistics. Um, and the way in which you present the finding, you don't just rush in there, say you have a month to live. You, know, you, you give the guy some hope, and that placebo effect can work. The Rambam was big on that. He held that the psychosomatic aspect of medicine was rarely, very real. That the way um, a patient... You know, my grandmother said that davening was her best medicine and that it was like putting on to fill in for a man. It lowers the blood pressure. The Essenes banned commercial transaction between members of the order who were expected to supply each other's needs without payment. Jewish Wars 2, uh, colon 127. The Qumran neophytes designated as the Sons of Dawn refrained from mercantilism. That is, they were communists of la Letra, and if you joined the community, you gave all your wealth over to this commune, so to speak. Um, I should mention their dualism. Uh, I don't want to get sidetracked on it, but they can refer to themselves as the sons of light, and they were very Gagan or Negid, the Romans, who they called the sons of darkness. The Dead Sea Scrolls sect uh, did, that is. Um, now, uh, the idea of immortality... Um, Let's just say the Pharisees hold that the soul is immortal, sucheton anthropos athanatos, and the rabbis went further, besides that, the soul of human being is immortal, not finite, and saying the bodily resurrection from Az Yashir Moshe, uh, Daniel Pasik that some will sleep in the dust will rise to praise, um, you know, Tal on Pesach, the dew is a remez, and Ashrei Yashrei Betecha Od Yalucha Sela, Od is extra, they will forever still always be praising you in their house. So, um, and there are many other remezim the Rambam brings down, for instance, in a classic tractate on proving bodily resurrection. But, let me say this, the Essenes had a very, very intense view 
of the next life, the afterlife. You can imagine if 85% of them were not having children and were living celibate, they very heavily believed in the afterlife and that there was some reward for their virtuous behavior. And they were virtuous. They lived very machmir. You know the joke of two rabbis on a plane, or three rabbis. One rabbi, um, uh, you know, turns to the secular guy next to him and he says, what do you make? I live in Silicon Valley. I make computer chips. Turns to the next guy, he says, I live in Idaho. I make potato chips and potato products, like corn chips. Uh, I mean, potato products. And then they ask the rabbi, what do you make? He says, I live in Muncie, I make chumras. Okay, but the guys in Muncie are not the Essenes, I'll tell you that. Um, but uh, people who are interested in the origins of Christianity, and Judaism, and Islam for that matter, are interested in the Essenes because uh, you have a very ascetic tendency here. And they had a view of the afterlife, the pardes, um, and uh, we could say much more about that, and I will later. But let's go back to the beginning. Who are the Essenes and what did they write? They wrote four different types of, uh, of, of genres, so to speak, and I'll mention some of them. They wrote in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Um, and uh, at the time, according to Dr. Fitzmeyer, Father Fitzmeyer, Hebrew was the language of the synagogue, Aramaic the language of the street and market, Greek the language of the educated tzedukim, and Latin the language of the government, like Pontius Pilate. You know, they found an inscription in Latin in Caesarea, Pontius Pilate. The three chief categories are represented amongst the Library of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They copied biblical texts. The oldest copy of the book of Isaiah dates from the community. All books of the Bible are represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Guess which one's not in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Megillus Esther. Maybe it was too secular for them, too assimilationist. A second genre of texts from the found in the library are called apocryphal and pseudo-apographical. These are works which are omitted from the various canons of the Bible and included in the Catholics canon, the Apocrypha, Ecclesiasticus, or the Wisdom of Ben Sira. Um, and uh, Rambam would call those Sefer HaChetzonim, but whatever it is, the Dead Sea Scrolls um, adopted the calendar of, of Jubilees, uh, which is a solar calendar. And I mentioned an Makant Yudish sect, the Damascus document, Brit Damask, which is uh, what was given my teacher, Dr. Baumgarten, by a Polish uh, clergyman named Milik, and I guess in, in, you know, in facsimile uh, photographs of it, and Dr. Baumgarten, uh, as well as many other expertise, uh, focused on this work and published uh, discoveries in the Judean Desert edition of it, as well as like three books and hundreds of articles on Dead Sea Scrolls, and some of them are filled with great secrets. You can learn a lot about rabbinic Judaism and normative Judaism and the evolution of halacha by studying Dead Sea Scrolls through the method of people like Rabbi Baumgarten, who is always comparing the Essenes halacha with rabbinic halacha and its development. And thikrun, as we would say. Now, the third genre of texts found in the Qumran Library are known sectarian works. These are texts related to the Pietistic commune, included ordinances, biblical commentaries, apocalyptic visions, and liturgical works. The most well known of these works include Serek Hayachad, the community rule, calendrical documents, Mishmarot, Torah precepts, Misat Masea Torah, the Pesher Hashaya. Pesher Habakkuk, the Brit Damas, the Damascus document. I talked, Dr. Baumgarten was given that from Millik um, and was allowed to publish on that with the uh, discoveries in the Judean desert. The War Rule, Serech HaMilchama, the Thanksgiving Hymns, Genesis Apocryphon, Aramaic Testament of Levi, Aramaic Apocalypse, Flood Apocryphon, Joseph Apocryphon, and guess what? They wrote extra psalms. The 150, David Melech and Heman and Moshe and Asaf and all the crew of writers of Psalms wrote are wonderful and nothing's ever been rivaled. Uh, they're theological pro poetry with a purpose that describe the whole gamut of emotions and the whole life of David Melech, which is found also in Shmuel Aleph and Bet and Divrei Ayamim, but uh, they made extra ones. They made extra Psalms because they wanted to thank God. And then there's a fourth category, and this is where censorship plays a role. They transmitted esoteric, secret teachings that had the moraine, according to rabbis, Torah Shabbat. And they thought they had the monopoly on what those secret interpretations were. I mentioned the songs of the Sabbath sacrifice, the Shir Shabbat, uh, known as angelic liturgy, 
which taps in possibly to a Gnostic tradition about God's chariot vision, the Mase Merkava, glimpsed by Eliyahu Navi going up in a fiery chariot, Yeshiyahu in Haftor Yitro, Bishnat Modu Ziyahu Amalek Vare, Ed Adani Yosheb Al Kisei Ram Benisa, and of course Yehezkel on the chamber in Babel, where he sees the reflection of the chariot in the water of the river, and the name of the river spells to bless, to ride, and cherub. And it occurs in the 30th year, 4th month, and 5th day of some king's reign, spelling Leda, to give birth. If you want to figure out that secret, see the Sefer Amur and Avuchim. So, these are also many other um, esoteric works that they publish besides the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice. And uh, I urge you, if you're interested in secrets, to look at them. Now, I'm going to look at one of them called 4Q401, which is about four streams from Gan Eden that fructify the vineyard pardes, and they draw on Yeshiyahu's metaphor of Klal Yisrael as the vineyard of Hashem. Now, there is the Hebrew that was found in a fragment where paradise is likened to the Beit HaMikdash, extended to the vineyard of Yeshiyahu's metaphor of the streams. And remember, in Gan Eden, in the first chapter of Genesis, we have four streams, Prat, Dekla, uh, Hedva, and Gihon, um, and so four rivers surround it, which is Kedem before. You know, so uh, in the, according to um, M. Ballet's edition in French, Oxford, 1982, he translated this Dead Sea Scroll fragment, which is on the vineyard of Hashem, which is the paradise or the pardes. I will say it in French. Que tes meilleurs fleurissons et ton pressoir à vin bâti en pierre, à la porte de la santé hauteur, ton plantation et tes magnifiques canaux. Les branches qui font tes délices. So, people who know French, this is pretty awesome poetry. These Dead Sea Scroll people, they knew how to write, and they claimed they were writing under Ruach and Kodesh. But, let's go on. There are a lot of texts like this um, that we could unpack. And to summarize things, I would say um, that um, the streams of joy, mirth, rejoicing, goodwill, love, friendship that pour forth from the throne of glory and flow like mighty mightily through the gates of the paths of the firmament of the Aravot, rivers are seen to issue from the divine paradise, as in Tehillim 46.5, are echoed in these fragments about their notions of paradise. And uh, look at my presentation in, in AJL in Cleveland if you're more interested in these really wonderful notions of the afterlife. They speak of spirits of knowledge, of truth and righteousness, in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, in the palaces of the seven heavens, forms of living divine beings, images of luminous spirits, all their deeds are of holy things, of wondrous unifications, figures of the shapes of divine beings engraved round around the glorious images of the sapphire pavement of splendor and majesty at his feet, and the images of their figures are holy angels. From underneath the wondrous devirium comes the sound of quiet stillness, the heavenly beings blessing, the king praising continually, unendlich, die heilige Gottes. So that's a translation in German of one of the fragments of the Essenes on immortality. They were far out. They, they really knew how to write. You know, Shakespeare looks like a child's play compared to some of their writings. Um, the existence of angels, they had a very, very elaborate uh, angelology. And if you want to see the details of that, check out my paper published in Cleveland with AJL. Nobody reads them, but it's there. And it's, it's my testament to the stuff worth reading in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, providence, free will, you know, they had strong providence. They basically, I wouldn't say they were Calvinists, but they, they believed that everything was in the hands of Hashem. In Judaism, you find a spectrum. Hakol Tzafui, Rishut Netana. Bechira is very important. The Rambam, as I mentioned in my lecture on Rambam, censorship of his guide to the perplexed. Uh, holds that you have to act as if there's free will, there's no accountability or responsibility if we don't, and life is capricious if we don't have that. The Rav Sajjig Owen, when he says on the verse, Atah Yadati Ke Yerei Hashem and Nikedet Yitzhak, he translates Yadati to a Rathtu Alnas in Arabic, medieval Arabic, which means in Arabic, I have made known, made known to mankind. And that is that, as the Dugan Yehuda would say, this was to teach human beings <coughs> of, that there was one human being, Avram, who brought ethical monotheism to the world and brought so many people under the wings of the Shekhinah by his open tent with he and Sarah offering Hachnot or Chim, that, um, that there was one such person that was brought to the Givalim, Rambam would say, 
of Amunah and Betachon. So, the, the tenth test, you know. Uh, the Pharisees rejected dualism. If somebody says, Modim, Modim, we give thanks, we give thanks, they are censored. That's a famous Mishnah. Um, and basically, uh, the uh, Essenes were highly dualistic. They believed in B'nai Or and B'nai Choshek. And they were the B'nai Or, they were the sons of light, the children of the dawn, and the Romans, who they predicted would destroy the Beit HaMikdash and Yerushalayim and put everybody in exile. Why do you think they buried their texts? They saw it coming! They saw it coming! They saw the Romans were going to sack the plates. And they were no dummies, and they buried their texts for posterity. 1950s and so forth, they were rediscovered by some shepherd Arab child, uh, sure heard her, you know, his goat fell through a cave and he heard broken pottery and bingo! People were excavating those caves all around Qumran and they found great discoveries. An exception, the copper skull uh, was really uh, deposited probably by the Kohanim and the Beta Mikdash. That was a, 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 what do they call that, a treasure hunt list of all great gold and silver that was in the temple treasury, including Ketoret, that was an expensive thing, the incense. Uh, and they actually found that in, in Zedkiyahu's tunnels, um, the Ketoret, but the silver and gold's waiting to be found from these treasure maps. Sounds almost something out of, like, you know, treasure hunt or something. But that copper skull is a little bit of an oddball. Uh, that was uh, pioneered and published by a scholar at uh, Johns Hopkins. Now, um, I was mentioning um, the, uh, uh, the, the dualism of the Essenes. Highly B'nai Or versus B'nai Choshek. Elbogen writes regarding um, the phrase, you know, modim, modim, if somebody says, we give thanks, we give thanks, the rabbis silence them because they don't want to think it's Zoroastrian dualism that, you know, um, we're giving thanks to the Persian deity of good and the Persian deity of the bad. Because it says, this is what Elbogen writes in German in his work on liturgy. Ein Schuss in diesem Text scheinen schon von üblich gewesen, so sein die Mishnah erwarnt und verpunt, zwei deren Sinn und Zweck und nicht mehr verstandlich sind, weil sie wahrscheinlich mit genostischen Anschauungen im Zusammenhang stehen, namlich die Wiederholung des Wort Modim am Anfang von und die Satz al ken zipor yigia rachamecha Vil tov yivarech tovim oder yizkor shemecha. Die jeden vor ans Ende gestalt werden, das Verbot hat nicht verhindert, das auch nach 300 Einzeln verbeiter sich die Freiheit nahmen, anlich Satz einzufugen. And that's from Berachot 33b. So dualism is censored. If one says, may the good bless you, in Megillah 419, um, that is censored because we don't believe in the Persian Zoroastrian system of, of a good deity and a bad deity. Um, you know, it's, it comes in the liturgy too. Yetzer Or of Re Choshech, Shalom of Re Ra, Ani Hashem Ose Kol Ela, which found itself in the Siddur um, excerpts that Hashem created light and darkness and makes peace between them, Isaiah 45 7. In the liturgy, however, in the Siddur, the change of the word Ra into Hakol is prompted by an aversion to having Ra directly associated with Hashem's name. So this is an example of how the rabbis censored dualistic notions. But we have to confess, these crazy Essenes, they were dualistic. They believed they were the sons of light and the Romans were the sons of darkness. But, you know, they predicted what happened. The Romans would sack the place and were still in exile because of it. The longest galut, as Yaakov in his vision of the angels going up and down the ladder, as one interpretation would have it. Now, um, I'm not going to pass over how they had a vision of Revelation uh, continuous from their Marha and Tzedek, and I'm going to pass over um, the Temple Yom, it's just complicated halacha at this point, um, and you can see in my presentation in Cleveland um, how I deal with that um, very carefully. The Para Adama, also complicated halacha. The, um, the Essenes, they commented upon the Paragadama. I'll translate in English. Garments with which he did not minister in the sacred precincts, and he shall gird the garments and slaughter the cow, the red cow, before him. And he shall carry its blood in a clay vessel 
which was sanctified by the altar. And he shall sprinkle of its blood with his fingers seven times toward the tent of meeting. And he shall cast the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet into the midst of its burning. So we have in 4Q276 fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls a kind of midrash on the Mishnah Para 3.7 where they said they used to defile the priest who was to burn the Paradama because of the Sadakites, the Sadducees, that they should not say that it must be made by those who had waited for sundown. Tevil Yom. Assert eligibility of Tevil Yom. Rabbi Yeshua insisted that even the utensils used in the Para Adama ritual must also be purified. So, again, Dr. Baumgarten's method was kind of kiruv. You learn some Dead Sea Scroll halacha about the Para Adama, but you can't do that without comparing it to the Parushim, the rabbis, and that means you've got to learn the Mishnah Para 3.7 and thousands of other Mishnayos to be able to deal with the halacha of these crazy Essenes, these sects of, um, in, in near Qumran. So, um, uh, a lot could be said about the halacha. I, guide, I again refer you to my paper. Of course, uh, 4Q277 is also dealing with the Tevil Yom in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the immersion of a menorah. Um, Tosefta Hagiga 335 relates that the Pharisees once immersed the menorah of the Beit HaMikdash on a pilgrimage festival. The Sadducees ridiculed this purification. Quote, it once happened that they immersed the menorah on a festival, and the Sudukim said, Come and observe the Pharisees who immersed the light of the moon. Your Shami substitutes moon for orb of the sun. Yalkut Pekude 40, number 419 in Midrash Tadshe, and Beit HaMidrash 3, page 175. The menorah represents the sun and the moon. Its seven lights, the seven planets, which serve the world. See Philo, Quis Rerum Divinarum, uh, Heres, 25, and Davita Moses, and Josephus Antiquities, 3, 146. Zacharias, 4, 10, is where this is all from, the seven branches of the menorah and the sits. Um, anyway, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had a lot to say about teveling the menorah after a pilgrimage uh, holiday, too. And uh, they were less strict. That's an exceptional case. They were usually more strict. Um, the Omer offering, whoa. You know, this is very complicated halacha, and uh, I remember spending a whole semester on this with Dr. Baumgarten. I'm going to let you look at my PowerPoint, but in essence, the Omer offering in Menachot 10.3, we would learn the Mishnah and the later Gemara on it with Dr. Baumgarten, and then the Tzedukim hold the Omer is brought on a Sunday because of fearful of doing agriculture work on the Shabbos. The, Tzeduk, the Perushim were not that way. Um, but however, the Omer on Sunday, the Essenes would harvest the Omer on the Sunday after Pesach. In Cave 4, a scroll fragment was found where the Essenes denounced the practice of waving the Omer on Shabbos as, quote, an error of blindness. The text reads, the mistake of blindness, accept your Sabbath. In the Masada text of the Essenes, the concept of forbidden gain, or Chadash, is made. So, um, we follow the Purushim, the rabbis. You know, we have 50, 50, 49 days of of Omer waving, which is so important because it's the basis of all our of our Sifrei Kabbalah. You know, the Rashbi ascended to Pardes on, I think, Chod Shabahod, and it's a reason for the 33rd date of the Omer that he ascended. In uh, Idra Zutra and the Zohar, where he's preparing his disciples to meet him later in Pardes as he's about to ascend and marry the Shekhinah, and he says to them from Perkei Avot, prepare yourselves to enter the Metrakalin. You know, um, we also find that on David goes up on Malchut Shabbat Malchut, which is on Shavuos, the last days of the Omer. And so these are very important things to rabbinic thought. And the Essenes had something a little bit, um, sort of, what do they call that? Uh, today it would be her heretical. Uh, but it's important to learn because it shows there was this diversity of opinion at the two millennium ago, just before the temple was destroyed. And it shows the origins of Christianity quite a bit, too, as a form of, I wouldn't say it, heresis, but uh, some rabbis might. And um, to mention that in the Ramban's notion of Shemitah HaOlamot, it's also based on um, the Omer offering. There are seven worlds, the Ramban notes. <clears throat> Each world is six, it dawns in 6,000 and sets in 7,000. 
Maimonides said never calculate these things. The Mashiach can come in Harif I and Augenblick, but um, there's no difference between Alam Hazan and a BMA Mashiach, except the state of Israel as Medina and Israel as a political entity will not be threatened by its neighbors, and the lamb will dwell with the wolf and the lamb or the Jews and the wolves, the other nations that persecute us, and the one preoccupation in the world will be to know Hashem, and they'll take the tanks and they'll deliver food in Africa to feed the hungry and elsewhere when there's droughts, and you know, the one preoccupation in the world to know Hashem, and you'll have a Mashiach, will get rid of a Malik, you'll institute all the laws of Shemitah, Yuvel, he'll rebuild the Beit HaMikdash, reconstitute the Sanhedrin, etc. But the Ramban and Nachmanides held that it'll dawn in six and set in seven based on the Pasuk and Dilem. Elif Shanim, Beinayim, Ket Mo, Arishana, um, a thousand years in your sight, O Hashem, is a watch in the night. So each creation day is a thousand years. If there's six creation days, it'll dawn in 6,000, set in 7,000. But the Ramban ups the ante and says there's seven worlds. So if there's seven worlds, there are 49,000 years of time itself. Bam! Wrap up time, temporality. We enter beyond the fourth dimension. That's 50,000 years of time. That's called Shari Bina. And that's where I don't really understand it, but from what I hear from Rabbi Weisblum, who's an expert on the Ramban, we will exist as disembodied intellects, and um, everybody will have their just desserts and so forth. And that will be way after Techeyas team. So I hope you're enjoying some of the uh, halachot of the Essenes compared with the halachot of the early rabbis, the Purushim. It's a lot of talking. A lot more could be said. See my PowerPoint and paper given at Cleveland at the AJL. But you can imagine a group where 85% didn't have children. They believed in the afterlife very seriously. And I want to cite some of the um, uh, aspects of rabbinic halacha that echo and resonate with some of their views of afterlife. Rabbi Eliezer the Great says, The house of Israel is a vineyard of the holy, or blessed be he. Do not glance. If you have glanced into it, do not descend into it. If you have descended into it, do not take pleasure in it. If you have taken pleasure in it, eat not of its fruits. If you glance and descend and take pleasure and eat of its Fruits, you are destined to be driven out of the world. Okay, so we see there from Seder for Eliyahu Rabbah, chapter 8, page 43, uh, a view of this vineyard metaphor, which I mentioned before. We find a parallel text in Avot to Rabbi Natan, the B text of Schechter, where Ben Zoma says, Do not glance into a man's vineyard, and if you glance, do not descend, and if you descend, do not look, and if you look, do not touch, and if you touch, do not eat. For if a man eats, behold, his tears himself away from the life of the world to come, and that of the world that is. So all these prohibitions, it's very much about the aspects of censorship, uh, of, you know, setting aside things that are the area of the esoteric that one should be cautious in exploring uh, their secret meanings, because, you know, the Arbus and Nicholas Suba Pardes, uh, some, some went crazy. You know, we recall um, the most well description of the Hagiga 14b, Tana Rabbanan Arbus and Nicholas Suba Pardes Ve'luhen Ben Azai Ben Zoma Acher Rabbi Akiva Mar Lehem Rabbi Akiva Kishatam Magin Eitzel Abne Shiesh Tahor Al Tamru Maim Maim Shum Shanamar Dover shakram lo yachvan neged enai ben azai hatzitz umeit alav hakatuv omar yakar bnei Hashem hamavta lechasidav ben zoma hatzitz v'nefaga de alav hakatuv omar devash matzata achol dayach pen tishavanu dekaritu acher katzitz v'nitiot. Rabbi Akiva Yitzay Bashalom. So four entered paradise, only Rabbi Akiva ascended and descended in peace. Uh, the other three, some not so great outcomes happened there. Um, but again, it's the metaphor of a paradise or an orchard. And we saw that in the uh, Sefer Eliyahu Rabbah, and uh, we saw it in the boat to Rabbi Natan, and we saw it in the Dead Sea Scroll fragment, which I quoted in French from Bailo's translation about the four rivers that surround it and so forth. Um, now, uh, Tosef the Hagiga Tufi rounds out the metaphor of Pardes in a parable as follows. To what manner be like in the king's garden? It is a balcony built over it. What must man do? Glance, only let him not feast his eyes upon it. The Tosef uses Pardes 
rather than Kerem. In Yuma 5a, there is mention that a curtain was in the sanctuary to not allow the public to glimpse the Heichal. Only on festivals was glancing permitted. Sefer Eliyahu Rabbah prohibits him glancing. Hechlo Tutarti confines, confirms that the prohibition of limiting access to the Pardes as the Lord's garden, being associated with the Merkabah, is found. Pay heed to the glory of the Maker and descend not into it, the Merkabah, and if you've descended to it, do not take pleasure in it. And if you've taken pleasure in it, you're destined to be driven out of the world. The Qumran texts so far have not revealed admonishments about entering and descending in the Pardes, nor the perils and dangers associated there. It seems that the decoded logic of the scroll associates the vineyard in Yeshua's metaphor as the orchard Pardes with the Merkabah, with the Beit HaMikdash, and the heavenly temple that they forecast the Romans would destroy the actual temple. The Qumran belief that the righteous men and angels will live eternally in this heavenly temple, in the eternal sanctuary of paradise, where is the vineyard of Hashem, documented in 4Q 511 2 Among the sevenfold purified, God will sanctify unto himself a sanctuary of eternity and purity among those who are cleansed from sin. So we see um, parallel and analogous traditions in the Essenes and in the Purushim and in the Surtukim, for that matter, uh, <coughs> echoing and uh, ricocheting off of each other in many interesting ways that shed a lot of light on the development of normative rabbinic uh, law and tradition. Now, Dr. Baumgarten contests that the Qumrites saw themselves in terms as constituting a Brit Chadash. Rather, he writes in French that they had a notion of revelation still speaking to their teacher of righteousness, the Murad Tzedek, and him being able to convey the revelation rather than just a bot kol. Baumgarten writes about this notion of revelation amongst the sectarians. <coughs> Unique oral Torah, modifications of oral law. The Damascus document, Brit no, Damascus, assumes the revelations are made to the sectarians via the Murad Tzedek. Baumgarten writes in French, L'écrit de Damas relie les origines de la communauté à la prise de conscience qu'il était des hommes coupables. Parce que eux-mêmes, comme tout Israël, s'étaient égarés à propos des choses cachées de la Torah que Dieu leur avait désormais révélées. So that's uh, from la loi religion de la communauté de Qumran. Annals, HSS, September, October, 96, number 5. He goes on. L'expression révélée, Hebrew nigla, selon lui signifieraient rien de plus que l'écrit tandis qui caché, Hebrew nistar, s'appliquerait à l'interprétation sectaire de celle-ci. Cette lecture restrictive de nigla peut paraître, paraître adaptée dans un certain contexte. <coughs> Tel ce passage où les hommes pervers sont des ponts, sont sous le monde comme ignorants des choses cachées, mais encore comme des transgresseurs flagrants des préceptes révélés de la Torah. That's in JQS 5,12. C'est-à-dire <coughs> celle mention de Isaiah 40, c'est l'étude de la loi qui il a promulgué par l'intermédiaire de Mose, afin qu'on agisse selon tout ce qui est révélé époque par époque et selon ce que les prophètes ont révélé par son esprit saint. Ces révélations progressives peuvent prendre la forme d'une exigence inspirée de l'écriture, mais aussi d'ajout ou de modifications apportées au texte canonique, c'est le cas par l'exemple de faits non scripturaires, de récoltes ainsi que des règles supplémentaires de purité. Recours par un sage de la communauté, ces révélations étaient gardées secrètes, la chose cachée, et transmises uniquement au sein de la secte. Le, tsec, le texte original de la Bible prévient de la révélation de vin, croit à leur propre texte qui les gardisait et développement les enseignements de Dieu selon divers reculs législatifs, secrétaires et selon divers commentaires, il provient également de la révélation de vin. So Dr. Baumgarten uh, showed that this uh, sect of the Essenes believe that they had revelation almost like 24-7 in their community. 
I could say a lot more about my own uh, relative by marriage, Dr. Amnesen. He considered similarities and differences in the theological leadership between the sect and the rabbis, but also with early Christians. Amnesen found pseudo-Cyprian epistle published in 1914, the phrase Unitatas Magister, teacher of unity. An identical title is known in the DSS as Murai Hayachad, the teacher of unity, CD 2114. The context of the phrase Magister Unitatis is that of the command to, quote, forsake kith and kin and follow the teacher of righteousness. This idea is alien to Judeans in the system of fearing one's mother and honoring and respecting one's father. Only Philo's description of the renegade therapeutai incorporates such an anti-Jewish commandment. Anderson argued that the passage in Pseudo-Cyprian 2, 19-25 revealed a mentality akin to the Quamranites and Christians, early Christians. So uh, scholars are very interested in how the Essenes, uh, really in their aesthetic tendencies, certainly uh, find echoes in monastic Judaism. Now, <clears throat> I want to focus for just a little bit, and maybe we'll call this our signature piece, because I know the hour is getting late, and everybody wants to have a mala malka with that wonderful sushi. So, um, about the challah offering. In rabbinic law, the term challah refers to the portion of dough set aside and given to the Kohanim based on Bab Midbar 15, 9-20. The tractate in the Talmud in the order of Zarim in this name deals with the laws of challah and its separation. In the first chapter, there is a discussion of the species liable to challah and to ties. Chapter 2 treats quantities which establish liability. 1.7 quarts requires separation of challah. The Essenes differed from the Pharisees' law by dictating that challah separation only be made, made one time per year. It's very different than the rabbis. Yet separation was made in each loaf, not batch. While the Pharisees and Essenes therefore differed on the frequency of challah separation, both groups sought to transfer the laws of the temple to their practitioners. The democratization of concern for ritual purity, thereby enacting an extension of the Torah from the spheres of the temple into daily life, was common to both Pharisaical community and Qumran. The rabbis did this in many ways. For example, each person's home is like a little Beta Mikdash, one Shabbos table is like a Mizbeach, one's challah is like the Shabbos uh, Lechem Panim, the Hagim like the Lechem Panim, the Kalim and the dishes in one's house like the Kalim and the Beta Mikdash, requiring tabling in a mikvah. Machon Mishnat Rabbi Aaron has recently issued a second volume of Tractate Hala, which is substituted, subtitled Piskei Harishonim, which presents one with the laws and pertaining to the mitzvah of the separation of Hala as they appear in various works, such as Halachot Gedolot of the Geonic Times until the Levushim of Rabbi Mordecai Yafe. Treatises printed and books quoted in the volume include Sefer Yeraim by Rabbi Eliezer of Metz, Sefer HaRokeach by Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Yehuda of Worms, Sefer Mitzvot Gadol by Rabbi Moses of Kusi, Or Zerua by Rabbi Yitzhak of Vienna, Hilkot Hala by Ramban, Piske Halala by Rashba, Minhage Maharil, and Tor Yored Dea. The chapter HaFarashat Hala of Machser Vitri, a student of the Rashi, was annotated by Rabbi Naftali Kohn. After Rabbi Kohn completed the work, the heads of the Machon Mishnah Rabbi Aaron became aware that the new edition of the Moxer Vitri, edited by Rabbi Ari Go Arie Goldschmidt, had been published under Otzer Aposkin. The notes of Rabbi Naftali Kohn are added to those of Rabbi Arie Goldschmidt. The text of the laws of Hala and Sefer HaRokeach that was printed in this new edition was taken from Rabbi Bruch Shimeon Schneerson's edition. Rabbi Aaron Mordecai Shadmi compared it with a manuscript found in the National Hebrew Library Library, corrected several errors. Piskei Harosh on Hilchot Hala was printed on the basis of three manuscripts and printed edition of Venice, 1521, was compared with the commentary of the Rosh on Mishnah. The edition also printed Kitzer Piskei Harosh on Hala based on several manuscripts preserved in the National Library. Piskei Harosh was edited by Rabbi David Aaron Sofer. Hilchot Eretz Yisrael ascribed to the author of the Torah, Rabbi Yaakov Bala Torim was copied from a Munich manuscript by Rabbi Menashe Grossberg, who added notes and source references. He sold his copy to Rabbi Yaakov Rabinovich, who published it in 1900 in London, with notes and 
Chidushim by his father Rabbi Eliezer Simcha Rabinowitz of Lamza. It was printed again by Rabbi Yaakov Zev Yaskovitz with notes and explanations together with a treatise of notes and Chidushim by Rabbi Mer Dan of Ostrova. The text and laws of Hala and Hilkot Eretz Yisrael in the volume before and above mentioned a new volume, two editions, printed on the basis of two manuscripts. The editors also draw on the manuscript of Rabbi Mordecai Gifter with explanations of Chidushim on Hilkot Eretz Yisrael. Rabbi Gifter had proved in his preface that Hilchot Eretz Yisrael was not written by the author of the Torah, but by another early authority. Rabbi Gifter's Hidushim are drawn upon several texts in the volume, required no editing, and were transferred from the edition of the Halachot Kedalot published by Machon Yerushalayim. Machon Mishnas Rabbi Aaron's presenting of a cold bow, a work that concentrates on the sources as well as the views of the sages of the Talmud and of the Rishonim and Achronim and the laws of Halah has been an important aspect to the development of rabbinic law. But we look at the early Mishnah. The rabbis separate in every batch. They differed from the Sudukim who separated one time per year. And look at this, the Essenes, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they didn't separate just in every batch or 40 uh, set. They separated each individual hala. One, You have two halot on Shabbos, Lechem Mishnah, they separated in each individual baking of each hala. That's more makmir. Like they're more makmir. 1,000 cubits for the tachum. They're more makmir. They weight five stars, not three stars. They're more makmir in their avoidance of oils. They're more makmir in many, many, many halachot. And Rabbi Baumgarten's method was to compare the halachot of the Dead Sea Scrolls with that of um, the Purushim and to boot the debates with the Pharisees. Now, a lot more could be said about the ritual purity of the Essenes. They um, were Kohanim, mostly disgruntled Kohanim, who were not satisfied with uh, the Kohanim of the Sudukim, who controlled the Ben Mikdash for a while. They were Hellenized Jews, the Sudukim. Uh, Alexander Janaeus was an example of them. It's it said, brought down in the second sukkah that he poured the water at the foot of the Mizbeach, and the rabbis who were in the courtyards peltered him with the Etrogim. And he had crucified in one day like 800 rabbis at the water drawing ceremony. A lot more can be said about that. See my paper published in Cleveland in the AJL proceedings if you're interested in that uh, Gemara about Alexander Yanai, who was a Suduki. And his sister was Stolom Zion, who was the sister of Shimon ben Shatach. And um, she reinstituted the Purushim afterwards. So the rabbis got control of the Ben Mikdash eventually after that stay with the Sudukim in control. But a lot of the Dead Sea Scroll Essenes <clears throat> sect were disgruntled Kohanim who didn't like the Sudukim power, according to some. And their ritual purity was really quite extraordinary. They were against Agrippa and approved that he was not allowed to enter the temple because of his alien ancestry, when in fact Agrippa stemmed from proselyte forebears. Alone argues that Agrippa's attendance at the Caesarian Theater, which included pagan rites, was enough to exclude him from the temple as a transgressor. 4Q Florilegium envisions a sanctuary unpolluted by the presence of any gare. Simon was extreme in his religious scrupulousness and thus made sure similar rationale with those at Qumran. Agrippa was the fourth generation and descendant of Udemian ancestors of Herod who converted to Judaism. The question is, are the Herodians really legitimate converts? Josephus logs the complaint of the Eudemians that during the Roman War the gates of Jerusalem were open to foreigners, but were closed to them. The fact that Nicholas of Damascus was employed by Herod to construct a fictional Jewish pedigree suggests his fear that the Eudemian ancestry might be an issue of slurs and disqualification. Thus, Antigonus referred to Herod as a hemiodeos, a half-Jew. Agrippa's daughter Bernice was married to Polemo, king of Cilicia, after he consented to Brit Mila, but when she deserted him, not long afterwards, Polemo was relieved um, simultaneously of his marriage and of further adherence to Jewish way of life. Herod was viewed by Jews as he was in Rome as a socius et amicus populi Romani. In Psalms of Solomon 17.7, Herod could be described as, quote, a man that was alien to our race. Allotrion genonois hemon. Salome, Agrippa's grandmother, disliked lack of regard for Jewish law. Ton a gene nomon. By divorcing Costobar, 
with the equivalent of a Roman repudium, Antiquities 15. The Jewish identity of Berenice and Agrippa's mother may have been fragile. Simon sought to deny Agrippa the privilege of entering the temple granted only to Jews. Twa a Yemensin. <coughs> so what I'm noting here is that these disgruntled Kohanim who were very machmir of the Essenes, um, they kept, they were very proud of their uh, pristine Kohanite lineages in general. And they lived in a very ascetic um, commune that was very spiritual. These songs of the Sabbath sacrifice, if you ever heard those sung, they blow your mind. They make the creative writing look like child's play of Shakespeare. <coughs> but um, they're poetry with a theological purpose. And um, they, their whole lives were about, as the Latin quote was stated, the penitence of God. They, they were totally spiritually 100%, uh, 24-7, involved in serving holiness and Hashem. And I hope you get a sense of censorship that's involved in uh, looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls. On the one hand, we have the censorship of the Harvard coterie of Jesuit scholars who denied access to many scholars, possibly with legitimate reasons, um, and how that was broken open by the release of the Bechtel Navigators and by Herschel Shanks coming to print with a simulated computer index of what some of the fragments should be, of course, on what had previously been released. And that opened things up to greater access to the scrolls. So that censorship was ended. Then I mentioned the personal examples in my family of uh, Dr. Joseph Amazon, who had a very hard life in communist Russia because he was a Jew and because of the anti-Semitism. They allowed folk studies of Yiddish uh, studies, but not Hebrew philology and weren't big on ancient Jewish texts like the Dead Sea Scrolls. He had a hard time finding a place to publish. He had a hard time finding a shtel. <clears throat> His brother-in-law, Dr. Arya Vilsker, also, when he discovered unknown poems of Rabbi Yoda Levi, had to go under the censors of the communists and send them, smuggle them out in the mail to Ezra Fleischer, who would verify their legitimacy that they were Rabbi Yoda Levi's poems, <clears throat> not found in Brody or the Shadal's editions. <clears throat> then we have the aspect of censorship that I hope you gained an appreciation on the latter part of our paper, and that is how the Essenes being more Machmir in general, 1,000 Amot for Tachum, five stars for end of Shabbos, avoiding oils, etc., etc. They were censoring the lightness, being Makel, of the Purushim, the rabbis. And the rabbis in turn were, were criticizing and censoring the Sadukim for their Hellenized interest in Greek texts and Hellenism. And um, so it's, it's an interesting mix of how censorship works on many different levels. It's about secrecy. It's about power. It's about authority. It's about poof-poofing uh, groups that you are in competition possibly with. And um, as I mentioned and opened up this lecture, we're dealing one day after Yudtet uh, Kislev, when the Balatanya's works, um, which were censored, um, the Balatanya himself was censored by Rechli Lut, tail-bearing, where the Mitnagim tattletailed to the Tsarist government authorities, and they imprisoned this great scholar, this great mystic, this Makubal, and he was released on Yudtet uh, Kislev, and Hasidim, Chabad Hasidim all over the world on this Shabbos we're celebrating and celebrating and we'll continue to celebrate the freedom and release of the Balatanya from prison and how not only his works, the Tanya and the Shulchan Aruch Arav and uh, Likute uh, Or and many of his other works were censored uh, but he as a human being, as a great Makubal, was also censored. And unfortunately, censorship goes on today. So in a nutshell, I want to shout out to Dr. Weissblum again for letting me uh, offer this lectureship on Dead Sea Scrolls, censorship at many different levels, uh, and yet uh, to be able to share my enthusiasm in the etymological sense of that word with you on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because remember, my teacher, Dr. Baumgarten's method was to compare the halachot of the Dead Sea Scroll sect with the Purushim with the early rabbis and the development of rabbinic halacha throughout the millennium. So in the process of learning about Dead Sea Scroll halachot, we learned a lot about regular normative rabbinic halacha and its evolution.
and I wish you a wonderful Shavua Tov, and may all our Mekubalim uh, be freed, and may everybody experience the light of freedom. Thank you.